but the geriatric population defined as adults age 65 years and older continues to rise as people are surviving longer due to health innovations and improved public health interventions across the globe. The geriatric population is projected to reach 80.8 million by 2040 compared to 54.1 million in 2019. As we move to an increasingly older population, it is important that pharmacists and clinicians, patients and their caregivers have an understanding of potentially inappropriate prescribing in geriatric populations and available resources, including the peers criteria. We'll be going over the, that today. So your presenters today are myself, Hannah McCarthy, Jack Mountain, and Terrence Nat, and we're all P3 students at the Yukon School of Pharmacy. To start the presentation, we will be discussing prescribing practices in elderly patients. So first, we'll start with the definition of polypharmacy, which the American Geriatric Society defines as the use of multiple drugs to treat diseases and health conditions. This is more common among older adults because as we continue to age, we develop more chronic conditions. So the CDC found that adults in their 60s and 70s um, most commonly used one prescription, at least one prescription medication, or, um, and 33% used five or more prescription medications in the past 30 days. The most commonly prescribed medications were lipid lowering medications, anti-diabetic medications, and beta blockers. Next, we'll look at some of the reasons for potentially inappropriate prescribing and the changes in older adult patients that lead to um, differing responses to medications. So first, we'll look at pharmacokinetic changes. And pharmacokinetics, which is often to, um, shortened to PK in simple terms, is how the body impacts the medication. So the principles of PK include how the medication is absorbed, distributed, metabolized, and eliminated. So decreased intestinal surface area and changes in gastric emptying lead to reduced absorption in medication. Increased fat and decreased total bo body water in older patients increases the volume of distribution, leading to an increased half-life of some drugs. Additionally, there are changes in CYP450 uh, enzymes, which are in the liver and responsible for metabolizing drugs, which leads to uh, limited overall hepatic metabolism. And there are changes in fetal function, which is indicated by a decreased GFR or glomerular filtration rate, which um, indicates decreased renal elimination of drugs. And next, we'll move into pharmacodynamic changes. Um, pharmacodynamics is how the medication affects the body. It's the response of the medication um, causes in the body. So the principles of pharmacodynamics include how the medication binds to the target, how intensely it binds, and what the impact is when the medication is used. So there are some pathologic changes in older adults in their organs, which leads to changes in pharmacodynamics. This includes drug receptor interactions, post receptor events, and homeostatic responses. And overall, these changes lead to altered sensitivity and response to drugs. So then we'll review the impact of potentially inappropriate medications. So potentially inappropriate medications, or PIMs, S, is a medication with risks that may outweigh the expected clinical benefits of the medication. So patient outcomes associated with potentially inappropriate medications include falls. Falls are associated with worsened health outcomes and decreased quality of life in older adults. Many falls can be attributed to medication, um, some which lead to orthostatic hypotension, which causes dizziness or instability when moving from a seated or laying position to a rising position. And additionally, many medications have the ability to reduce alertness and slow reflexes, which may also contribute to falls. Additionally, some medications may alter mental status and increase confusion. Some medications worsen memory or in thinking or increase confusion. Um, this is especially important in people who already have cognitive problems or older adults who are more sensitive to these effects. And finally, some medications in older adults have the potential to increase mortality. Overall, all of these negative outcomes impact healthcare costs. So medication-related problems in the United States and adults aged 65 and older is associated with healthcare costs of $177 billion each year. Um, these costs are associated with increased hospital admissions, increased length of stay, um, and increased primary care and emergency department visits. All right, and now we're going to transition to talk about what the actual beers criteria is. 
So what is it, what's included, and how does it prevent inappropriate prescribing? So the BEERS criteria is monitored and updated by the American Geriatric Society, which is a professional society for interprofessional healthcare workers practicing geriatric medicine. The BEERS criteria is guidelines for healthcare professionals to improve the safety of prescribing in older adults. It includes five lists uh, which organize the BEERS criteria. The lists are medications that should be avoided in most older people, medications that should be avoided in older people with specific health conditions, medications that should be avoided in combination due to drug-drug interactions, medications that should be used in caution for potential for harm, and medications that should be dosed differently or avoided in renal dysfunction. So who's included in the BEERS criteria? Just to keep some things in mind, the target population is adults over 65 in most settings. Uh, the settings excluded are palliative care and hospice care patients. So as mentioned, the criteria are organized into five lists. The first list is potentially inappropriate medications in most older adults. This list has recommendations on medications to avoid in most older adults due to increased risk of adverse events, some of which Hannah had mentioned previously, fall risk, delirium, toxicity, et cetera. So some of the medications that fall into this list include first-generation antihistamines like diphenhydramine. These medications should be avoided because of the increased risk of the anticholinergic effects that come with reduced clearance with increased age. These effects include increased risk of confusion, dry mouth, constipation, and others. Use of diphenhydramine in special situations, such as acute treatment of severe allergic reaction, may be appropriate. Use as a hypnotic for sleep is inappropriate and tolerance to the drug will develop. Another example includes benzodiazepines. Uh, benzodiazepines include diazepam, lorazepam, or alprazolam, and they're generally inappropriate because older adults have increased sensitivity and decreased metabolism to these agents. In general, all benzodiazepines increase the risk of cognitive impairment, delirium, falls, fractures, and motor vehicle accidents, but these are of greater risk and of greater concern in older adults. These medications may be appropriate for seizure disorders, withdrawal, uh, alcohol, or benzodiazepine withdrawal, uh, severe generalized anxiety disorder, and end-of-life care. But in most older adult patients, it should be avoided. So the second list in the BEERS criteria is potentially inappropriate medications in older adults with certain conditions. So there are certain conditions or medical histories that make specific medication agents less appropriate. This category provides recommendations on medications to avoid based on potentially exacerbating these diseases. So an example of a condition that warrants consideration uh, is patients with a history of or current presence of ulcers. So some non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, um, especially those who are not COX-2 selective, carry risks of developing or worsening ulcers. Uh, because of the risk, there is a, an alternative agent should be used to prevent potentially exacerbating the ulcers the patient has or potentially reforming those ulcers. And the third list, uh, as stated, was medication combinations that might cause harmful drug-drug interactions. So this list highlights drugs that should not be taken concomitantly due to adverse events and toxicity when the medications are taken in combination. So an example here is warfarin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So warfarin is a type of blood thinner used in those with risk or history of blood clots to prevent complications that come with new blood clots. NSAIDs like ibuprofen or naproxen are used for multiple different conditions and can actually be purchased over the counter for headaches, fevers, and body pains. NSAIDs should not be used in people who take warfarin because NSAIDs increase the risk of bleeding and can interfere with warfarin monitoring, increasing the INR. Okay, and I'll be finishing the list of conditions that we should look out for on the beers criteria that Jack was just listing off. So currently, we try to look out for medications that are cautious in patients where we're looking at the harm versus risk and medications that may provide a clinical benefit but carry higher risk of harm are meds that we should typically avoid. And an analysis should be done with both the pharmacist and the provider to try and assess whether we want to continue or discontinue these meds in patients. So an example of this is the use of aspirin for primary prevention of cardiovascular events versus the risk of bleed. We typically used to assume that in patients up to the age of 65, aspirin was a great first line uh, use of a med for primary prevention. But as patients get older, we start to try and 
assess whether that risk for bleeding events, which does become much greater in elderly past the age of 65, we try to analyze if that's a method that they should continue to use or if we should just discontinue it and try to assess if we should try them on another medication for further uh, prevention. And then another medication that we try to assess is the use of antipsychotics in the elderly. A lot of different drug classes such as SSRIs, SNRIs, and tricyclic uh, medications are also used for anxiety and depression. And we see that as patients become older, they become much higher risk for electrolyte imbalances and SIADH, which is a symptom of antidiuretic hormone imbalances, ends up changing the levels of sodium in their body and they end up suffering from hydro, hyponatremia which can cause a lot of different side effects such as uh, nausea headache and altered mental status and these are things that we try to avoid in patients as they become older so that's these are meds that we try to uh, discontinue if we see that that risk is greater than the benefit of maintaining them on these medications and then next uh, we also look for medications where we have to renally dose adjust because as patients become much older their renal function does begin to decrease at a very high rate, and we have to try and adjust medications based on their creatinine clearance. So, two examples of medications would be gabapentin. Uh, we want to try and dose adjust this med and more or less try to avoid it because as creatinine clearance decreases, this med can accumulate very much in the kidneys, and this leads to great levels of toxicity. And then tramadol, which is another uh, opioid that we try to avoid when patients have low creatinine cleared. It's because it becomes very hard to clear it from the body. And again, this leads to increased kidney injury. And so last, I'll be going into who should be using the beers criteria. So first we try to get more interaction between the beers criteria and clinicians. So as pharmacists, we try to make them more aware of patients aging and its impact on the use of pharmacological treatment. Using the beer criteria as a warning light, as we like to say, it's not a be all end all that the beers criteria is, all right, we have a list of meds that we absolutely can't use in patients. It's more of, we use this list to start a conversation between clinicians as to why patients are using this medication and is it completely necessary? And again, analyzing that risk versus benefit, um, trying to find if there's a safer, safer alternative for medications that this patient can use in regards to medications that are on the beers list and what patient specific factors a patient might have that increase the risk for them when they're on, when they're using a medication that is on the beers criteria list. And then next we go into starting that conversation with patients as well. They're another population that we obviously want to look at the beers list. Even though a medication's on the beers criteria, it doesn't mean that the med has to be discontinued. Patients should again utilize this list as a tool to engage both their pharmacists and their clinicians in terms of treatment regimens and also begin to start conversations with their healthcare team as to whether they should be on these medications or not. Uh, looking at questions such as side effects that they're experiencing from the medications and determining if that risk benefit again is truly necessary, if their medication is truly helping them versus if there's an alternative that they can look at. And that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much for your time. Um, our contacts are below if you have any questions regarding the information that we've gone over. And we'd like to again thank you for this presentation. And here are our references.